Good evening. I'm Nivedita Mukherjee and you're watching Budget with BS, the very special budget show from Business Standard. I'm here with my co-host Ruchika Chitravanshi. Hello from New Delhi, the scene of action in the budget season. Wish the budget heat could do something to the winter chill in Delhi. Yes. <laughs> In the previous two episodes, we set the tone of the union budget 2023-24, listing out the backdrop and the fiscal challenges before the government. Yes, and in this third episode of Budget with BS, the spotlight is on taxation, which is undoubtedly the most watched part of the budget. Shrimi Chaudhary, who is in the habit of scooping news from the Revenue Department, gives you a sense of what's likely this budget on the taxation front. government's efforts to provide a stable and predictable tax regime, the direct tax proposal in Budget 2023 may not see a big bang announcement on taxation front. However, it could propose tweaking a not-so-popular tax regime to make it attractive for taxpayers. Besides, we might see some revision on imported duty items in continuation with government efforts to make in India and Atmir Bharat initiatives. We have been given to understand that policy makers took up and deliberated three key tax-related items during the budget-making exercise. Industry expects that some of these might see the light of day. Here is a glimpse. From the financial year 2021, taxpayers have had the option to choose from two personal income tax regimes, the old and existing regime, which offers deduction and tax rebates, and the new optional tax regime, which offer concessional rates but no deduction and tax exemption. The new regime was introduced to simplify tax filing and reduce the burden, but it failed to attract taxpayers. This failure was blamed on the scheme not providing taxpayers with social security or life insurance-related tax benefits. Acting on the feedback, policymakers have been working to reinvent the new scheme. Sources tell us that the North Block Mandarins have been considering increasing the threshold of tax-free slab from the current 2.5 lakh rupees to 5 lakh rupee. This will lead taxpayers with more disposable income and they can invest this extra money suitably. Practically, taxable income up to 5 lakh rupee is also tax-free in the optional regime. But there is a catch. In this new regime, an individual gets 7 slabs of tax rates and the highest slab rate of 30% applies when the taxable income exceeds rupees 15 lakhs. In comparison to this, in the existing regime, there are four slab rates and the highest slab rate of 30% applies when the taxable income exceeds rupees 10 lakhs. Despite this, the new regime could not attract many taxpayers because you have to lose many exemptions and deductions. So for the upcoming budget, my suggestion would be the government should focus on making more attractive either by reducing the tax rates or increasing the last lab of 30% after rupees 20 lakhs. Further, at least three deductions should be allowed in this new regime. Standard deduction of 50,000 rupees, which is allowed to an employee. Section 80C towards life insurance, children education fees, repayment of housing loan, and Section 80D for the health insurance policies. Over the last few budgets, the government has increased custom duties on finished products. This has been a key element of the government's push to incentivize local manufacturing. Budget 2023 might follow similar trends. Officials hinted that the government might increase import duties in sectors where production-linked incentives are being considered. We might also see an increase in custom duties in some sectors linked with free trade agreement with India. The move intends to make these agreements more attractive to global trading partners and give the government a stronger negotiating position for such deals. Meanwhile, the government is unlikely to restore duty concession on nearly 400 items. These items include capital goods, farm products, medical devices and textiles. These duty concessions were removed to promote domestic industry. For certain products which are subjected to export duty. The larger concern when it comes to union budget is in respect of the rate related changes that keep happening year on year. This year also is no exception. While a lot of customs duty exemptions have been weeded out over the previous years, we can expect to see some changes in the union budget, largely driven by the fact that there are some FTAs that we have recently signed and some FTAs that are in the process of being signed. So keeping in mind the fact that the FTAs are intended 
to promote foreign trade from India and into India, keeping also in mind the fact that domestic self-sufficiency or Atmanirbhar Bharat is a very big thing as far as we are concerned. The focus to my mind would be in ensuring that raw materials and intermediaries are taxed at a lower rate and possibly finished goods are taxed at a higher rate. Expert contend that the current capital gains tax structure creates a tax arbitrage and makes it prone to evasion. Policy makers, however, believe this is a complicated matter and requires wider deliberation with all stakeholders. They argue that there are better platforms than the union budget for it. So rationalizing the capital gains tax structure may not be the part of budget 2023. Going beyond taxation, it's time to bring in a slice of India Inc. into the show. What is it that corporate India is looking for? Nivedita, you spoke to the President of Confederation of Indian Industry or the CII, Sanjeev Bajaj, on multiple issues uh, that the budget can address. What were the key takeaways? Well, listen in. Hello, Mr. Bajaj, and uh, welcome to Budget with Business Standard. Thank you. So, how high are your expectations from this budget? Budgets are always uh, a process for providing a direction uh, to the country for the coming year, uh, a direction on the priorities of the government, focus areas, um, and also it's a budget. So, it's a, it's also a hisab kitab of the government uh, for the country. Now, we know that our budgets in the last few years have been... Uh, very high on reform and especially through the pandemic when uh, private sector has not been able to grow in the same manner and add uh, to capital investment we have seen the government play a very significant role with capex support that has come in from infrastructure growth and uh, this has played a very important role uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, India is showing a reasonable level of resilience, but we are still living in a world which is uh, quite fragile. We are seeing slowdowns in major economy. And uh, that is why we hope that uh, the budget will continue to focus on uh, significant uh, public capex so that uh, we are able to ride through this cycle, uh, at least till when private sector is able to play its own part in um, investing and adding to the capex cycle so you mentioned you know the expectation is that government will again uh, spend on capex but isn't this budget coming at a time when uh, big elections are due and 2024 election is just one year away so in some sense this is uh, the last budget last full budget before election so do you think it's going to be a populist budget i believe that uh, if you Look at the actions of uh, this government even in past years, including in budgets pre-earlier elections. Uh, the budgets have been balanced and have been focused on building the economy. Um, and that is what we hope will happen uh, this time as well. So uh, you don't think there will be major spend on uh, social sectors like health and education, etc., as is being uh, projected. I, I see such spends as going near, uh, beyond mere populist measures. Um, we are a country with a very large population. It's a population which needs to be able, needs to have access, whether it's to health, whether it's to education. Also keep in mind that we are an uh, economy where 60% of our GDP comes from uh, consumption. So the more prepared that we make our citizens and health education play a very important role. We are actually helping priming up the economy. And keep in mind, those spends also done correctly help in generating new jobs. So uh, to me, those become important elements of the budget or can be important elements of the budget. I don't see them as mere populist measures. So uh, CII has made some interesting recommendations already. You've made a presentation to the finance minister, Ms. Uh, Nirmala Sitaraman. Uh, so you've uh, asked for uh, employment. Also, job generation is uh, one of the demands that, uh, you know, you've asked for. Then uh, you've asked for um, reduction in taxes. You know, let, let me broaden this out to say that from uh, CII's perspective, there are... Uh, 
a few clear asks from the budget that we have uh, put forward in our pre-budget uh, suggestions to the government. The first is that we have seen a period of fiscal expansion that was required to protect lives and livelihood uh, through the pandemic. And uh, we need to get back to some level of better fiscal management. And there are three uh, suggestions over here that um, CI has actually made. The one is that uh, in this year, the budget should adhere to the fiscal deficit target of 6.4% of GDP and move towards 6% for the next year, FI24, and thereafter 4.5% by 26, so that we get back into the direction of uh, fiscal uh, discipline over the next couple of years. Um, it's also e equally important for fiscal management to ensure that the government is able to augment its uh, revenues. And uh, that is where an aggressive focus on continued privatization is required. Our suggestion actually is that as line ministries um, identify um, businesses that can be privatized, why not then give the responsibility and authority for uh, disinvestment to uh, DPAP so that uh, they can then go ahead in a concerted manner and help with uh, faster uh, divestment of uh, these assets. In addition, uh, as part of our national monetization, asset monetization pipeline, uh, the government should target higher asset monetization. So this will help uh, get further revenues as well. And a third part that we've talked about for fiscal management is really to broaden the tax base. Now, our current tax to GDP is about 11.7%. Uh, and we think that we need to take this to at least 16% by rationalizing GST rates, because that's not a budget issue uh, that will be ta hopefully taken later, and reforming the tax administration so that the government earns more from tax as well. So um, the first large part of our recommendation is around this uh, fiscal management. But let me come to a few other important areas as well. The second part of our suggestions goes around investment-led growth strategy. And over here, uh, as we talked, the government has played a significant role in public capex in the last few years. We believe that like last year, the budget should increase capex by 35%, taking it to rupees 10 lakh crore, and also focus a lot on rural infrastructure. Uh, this will not only create uh, additional employment in rural areas, but it will also then boost rural demand in the coming years, which is very important for our domestic economy. So this is another important area. The third area that I would like to talk about, um, and which is very key for a country with 1.4 billion people, is generating jobs. This is something which is not only about meeting the aspirations of our citizens, of our youth, but it is equally about broad-based consumer demand. And if you look at so many of these initiatives that we are suggesting, just creates an ideal glide path because these measures are not for a year or two. They have to be there for the next decade and more. And this is really India's decade, and that's what we are working towards. You know, uh, many ministers have referred to this animal spirit. And uh, do you see the budget doing anything that will really, uh, you know, make the industry invest more? I would say the government has already done a lot uh, by bringing the tax rates down. It has made it very attractive to invest in India. We are competitive globally now when it comes to these tax rates. The PLI schemes uh, by themselves have provided direction on a whole set of industries and so I believe that there is no single bullet. There is already a significant amount of action that the government has taken. But we have to also keep in mind that um, private sector looks at a certain minimum return on investment. We raise private capital and um, we are responsible for that. So you will see sector by sector um, investments take place as capacities get used up. Uh, there is no single bullet that we want from the government. The government is already doing a lot. We just uh, hope that the government continues with its own uh, public capex investment because that will handhold this economy through this period till the private sector brings their animal spirits back, as you say. Do you agree that businesses are cautious? Depending on sector by sector, if you look at, for example, real estate, if you look at housing, if you look at construction, these are growing 
significantly. If you look at financial services, credit growth in the last few quarters is already up. So there are sectors that have started, and if financial service sector is starting to give out more credit, it is to industry for additional investment. Uh, so I believe that this is uh, a phase where uh, as long as the external environment stays uh, uh, reasonably balanced, you will start seeing private investment uh, coming in the coming quarters. That's a good thing to hear. And uh, you've also spoken about 10% uh, growth, 7 to 10% delta you've spoken about and, uh, you know, how to achieve 10% growth and uh, it will be a new India, so to say. You've spoken about that. So do you think that we'll reach this 10% growth in the coming years? If so, by when? We must reach this 10% growth. That's the opportunity that the world is providing to India. That's the responsibility that we have to our country, to our citizens. It, it is something that is a combined effort of government policies, practices um, that we have seen our government uh, put in place very proactively and aggressively. It is about the Indian entrepreneurial dream. And we can see that with the entire startup culture. It is equally about large business in India and the way they are growing, they are expanding internationally. Uh, what we are seeing now in India is a new, confident, forward-looking India that is ready to take on the world on equal terms. Realistically speaking, you have to, if you have to guess, you know, what is budget going to give to the industry? Uh, what is that one thing that you're going to bet on? Yeah, I, I think in such interviews, you know, it's these one kind of things that people want to focus on. As I've already mentioned, we've in six areas, we've given a whole set of recommendations. There is no one silver bullet. Uh, the budget is not a single line item. It's a combination of multiple line items. And that's why the recommendations that we have made, um, I believe, are all very important to set the right stage for growth going forward. Thank you so much, Mr. Bajaj, for speaking to us. Thank you. Sanjeev Bajaj has a long wish list for the budget, from tax tweaks to job creation and much, much more. But what's striking is his belief that the industry's animal spirit will be out soon and that it surely is India's decade. Well, he's not the only one to say that. The industry does see a silver lining in India in the midst of all the global gloom. And now, Nivedita, to my favorite section, the budget nugget. Yeah, Ruchika will take us through a fascinating journey about the finance ministers who have presented five budgets back to back. Not many finance ministers of India hold the record of presenting five consecutive budgets. Nirmala Sitharaman would become the fifth finance minister in independent India's history to present five consecutive budgets under the same government with no general election between 2018 and 2023. Who has achieved this feat before her? The first finance minister to present five budgets back to back was C.D. Deshmukh. The FM for all budgets between 1952-53 and 1956-57. In recent memory, P. Chidambaram also presented five consecutive budgets from 2004-5 to 2008-9. Sita Raman's predecessor, late Arun Jaitley, also presented five consecutive budgets under the Narendra Modi government. In fact, he rose to present the budget even when he was not in the best of health. Jaitley presented five budgets from 2014 to 2018. Former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh is also on this list, with one of the most iconic budgets in independent India's history. As the 22nd Finance Minister of India, Manmohan Singh presented the budget every year from 1991 to 1996. Singh's 1991 budget is known for path-breaking policies. It drove India towards economic liberalisation and reforms by shunning the past policies of Inspector Raj and import substitution. The short list of FMs who presented five consecutive budgets also points out another fact. FMs were changed frequently and ministerial portfolios were reshuffled. Not just FMs, but even governments were unstable in various periods in independent Indian history. In 1997, weeks after the budget was presented on February 28, there was a political turmoil. The Congress party, then led by Sita Ram Kesari, withdrew support and the Devagoda government collapsed in April 1997. By the time the budget was passed in May 1997, a new government was in place. 
Talking of consecutive budgets, Pranab Mukherjee was the only finance minister so far to have presented an interim budget before general elections and then a full budget immediately after. This was in 2009, as the Manmohan Singh government returned to power. All governments retaining power have incidentally appointed a new finance minister to present the full budget. The last such example was Piyush Goyal presenting the 2019 interim budget and then Nirmala Sitharaman presenting the full budget that followed. You make a very interesting point, Ruchika, that the list of FMs presenting five budgets in a row is short because of plenty of cabinet reshuffles earlier. And uh, clearly, that is not the case anymore. That brings us to the end of the third episode. Do tune in on Tuesday for another exciting show. Thanks for watching and see you on Tuesday. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.